Hello and welcome to Tungfall Helmets, your occasional spicy hot take roundup of the latest F1 rumours, all with the most believable conspiracy theories to back them up. Everything here is carefully researched for hours to make sure it's totally founded in logic, reason and truth. Or not. Who knows? Dominic, I want to lead off this podcast right away by saying, man, what a race that was. Coming out of the second rest day, you know, uh, Pogacci was only about 12 seconds behind Vindegaard there. It was all leaning into the time trial. And man, if you haven't gone back and watched like some of those recap videos that show side by side how much faster Vindegaard was going through the corners. Yeah, he took a minute and a half out of Pogacci alone and three minutes out of his teammate, like in the whole field. People are suspicious of the performance, but man, when you see how quickly he's railing those corners, he got three seconds on Pogaccia in the first like corner. It was impressive to watch. Then you move on to the mountain stage. Pogaccia surprisingly cracks, loses six minutes. Tours wrapped up pretty much by that point. We got a couple good uh, transitional stages going to the end. Great win by the the Bora rider on the Champs. I think overall it was a fantastic Tour de France, and I'm really looking forward to uh, Super Worlds next month with uh, all the worlds happening in Glasgow. It'll be great. Until the end there, I thought you might have been talking about IndyCar or possibly Le Mans. And I thought the Le Mans had already happened, but then you closed it for me at the end because one of the people you're talking about sounded like some kind of IndyCar person. Yeah, I, I did have to look up uh, whether uh, Vindegaard was Danish or Dutch because I'm like, dear God, is this another sport that's going to end with the Dutch national anthem at the end? They've been trying for a long time. They've, they've got their dominance sorted. That's what happens when you invest in your youth is that you're eventually able to bring them up and dominate world sports. I mean, the Danes love a good uh, good road race, that's for sure. Indeed. Shall we go into, have we got anything right before, uh, or did you need to talk more about the Tour de France, which I know nothing about? Uh, no, I, I think I'm good. I just, I think it was a good, I think it was a, I think it was a pretty good tour. I'm, I'm yeah. I, I'm almost ready to resubscribe to Netflix so I can watch the Drive to Survive for the cycling world. So oh, yeah. Uh, Unchained was very much the Drive to Survive, like the, the same sort of, uh, over the top dramatization of stuff. Uh, it was it was so great to watch. It was it had me equally like laughing on the edge of my seat. I look forward to attempting to watch that then. So have we got anything right? Uh, first off, uh, Perez misses Q three again. No, we did not get that wrong, but barely. Sorry, did not get that right, but barely. It was close. I mean, he was P three in Q two, wasn't he? He was, but he was ninth in. Uh... Q1. Yeah, he had a shit qualifying, but I wouldn't say he barely missed Q3. We were wrong either way. Uh, the next one was Perez makes it to Q3 for the first time in five races. We got this one correct, uh, but barely. You know, I think we have a good strategy here of predicting the opposites, and we're guaranteed to get one right. Indeed, but you know, at the end of the day, we need to be aligned about our beliefs and our spicy takes that we're predicting, because otherwise what value are we adding to everybody? Everybody else can come up with those. I do think it's important to note that Perez, in his post-qualifying interview, said he should have been fourth, uh, which I thought was funny, given that he was starting from ninth. Uh, Like, it's not like there was a red flag. It's not like anything else happened. He just didn't drive fast enough. He did admit he made a mistake, and that's what what cost him. Yeah, but then don't say, I should have been fourth, because you got got your just desserts. And when your teammate's first, shouldn't you be second? Uh, Next item on the list, uh, and this was mine, and I am so sad about this. Uh, Merck slides back even more. Um, and the conclusion is, no, I was wrong. But yet, also, I don't think they capitalised on the weekend as much as they could have done. Uh, the exact prediction was one mark behind one Alpine, but we'll get to that later. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I was wrong here, so never mind. Next item was uh, McLaren continues good performance, but not as good as Silverstone. I was wrong again. Uh, they did pretty good. That, that was impressive. Yeah, they, they really, they chucked those cars up the grid. That was impressive. I am waiting for the post-season or mid, maybe we'll get it in the summer break where somebody does a breakdown of what, like, the behind the scenes. Because I, I still don't accept how they went from crap to the front. Like, what was it that was that they've changed? Well, Fernando Alonso definitely has a, a, a thought on that, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay. Uh, next one was Ferrari does not go forward and cooks their tires. Um, they and are behind Aston Martin in quali. Uh, one of them was behind in uh, quality, uh, but then the race also predicted one Ferrari ahead and one Ferrari behind uh, the Aston Martin. That was also pretty wrong. There was some real uh, Ferrari on Ferrari drama this weekend. We're going to get to that for sure. Oh, yeah. F- yeah. Ferrari. Ferrari going to Ferrari. Uh, the next uh, prediction was we would get the first driver changes. Uh, first driver changes get full throated rumors. Uh, we both had the rumors and a new driver change. So that was pretty good. Uh, we'll talk about that in the special between waste drama, just to let you all guessing what might have happened. 
Uh, and then the last one was Danny uh, Rick impresses at the tire test in Silver. And the conclusion from that, I think, was yes. He impressed so much that uh, what Christian Horner was on to helmet Marco while Daniel was still on track. Marco fired Nick DeBreeze and then immediately called Christian back. Like, I don't even think Daniel was out of the car before he had that Alpha Tauri drive. Oh, I'm pretty sure he had it before he got in the car, based on the video that they recorded. They did a behind the scenes of the tire test, uh, and it was clearly filmed from the moment he was walking in the door at Silverstone that he clearly knew what was happening. I I think there's I think they might have thought it was likely, but I also think like there's a lo- there's a lot. Danny has a big fan base. And a lot of people, including myself, were happy to see him go back to Red Bull. So I think no matter what, they were going to capitalize on like, look, it's Danny's first time back in an F1 car since, you know, Abu Dhabi. This is great. This is good for him. So I think they were, that was going to happen regardless. But the fact that it was like, yeah, that, that Nick is out. And man, that was so unceremoniously like out. Like Alpha Tari didn't say anything like, thanks for, thanks for being a great like, <laughs> well, I guess he wasn't great at anything. Yeah, Red Bull go to Red Bull. Was that Lewis's comment in the in the in the uh, press conference this week? Of, I missed that. What was that? Oh, there's some of the lines of like you know mid season driver replacement, and Lewis is, is like, "Is this weird?" And he's like, "Well, it's not for Red Bull." <laughs> uh, so we blurred straight into between race drama, um, which Debris is out, which we'll talk about again when he gets fired because I'd like to reiterate that he got fired, um, and Danny in. Uh, so that was pretty. That was pretty surprising. I, I was not expecting it to happen so quickly. I, I thought mid-season summer break was going to be when we'd see it, but uh, but yeah, they just they they threw him right in there, and I'm I'm sure we'll talk more about it. But it, it definitely seems they've almost put Perez on notice, and he was definitely driving in at least free practice one, like he was on notice. Uh, yes, because going off at the first lap that you were trying, good work, Perez. Good work. Um, Next on the list, though, in Between Race Drama, is apparently there's a strong rumor that Lando is trying to... Sorry, Marco, speaking of Red Bull, is trying to get Lando Norris to Red Bull for 2025. Um, my comment on this is, why would you do that? Why, as you as Lando, would you go to the team with Max? Well, I think the bigger thing is, I think I saw rumors that Lando was going to every team in the last two weeks. <laughs> Uh, Which, given I, the performance of the car... I, I think I sent you a meme at some point in time that was, like, the 2025 driver lineup and every car had Lando in it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's great for Lando. Maybe he signed a contract with McLaren a little too early if everybody seems to be wanting Lando's services. Um, but, yeah, but also, you know, I think if we were going to talk if we were talking about this back at the start of the season, we'd be like, oh, yeah, man, Lando's, Lando's going to be out of McLaren. He's going to want to go be in a top car suddenly the Maccas are coming up and like I think it's interesting to look at it from the perspective of uh Lando puts the rumors out because he would like to re-up his contract yet again for even more money sure because if you're Zach Brown and you're collecting drivers you don't want to lose one you need to make sure you've got them all yeah it's it's a it's a Pokemon game for Zach indeed uh next big bit of big news and this is probably the most groundbreaking news that's going to shake the world um apparently Shakira has broken up with Lewis because she apparently is dating somebody else which would explain, like, it finally got to Lewis today in the race, and that, that's just why his race was not what it should have been. He's, he's emotionally distraught. I, I, do, I do want to think his, his whiny radio messages were a little bit more monotone today than normal. They were a little bit more, you know, Bono, my tires, they're just, they're not as good. He must have had a talking to from Toto after his whining last week, two weeks ago. Uh, and last but not least, uh, this one might be longer, might be short, but I've got a spicy hot take about some news. Uh, Latifi came out and basically admitted that race dri- uh, driving race cars was in for nothing but a hobby because uh, he's going to go and do an MBA. I think it's important to take away that the key fact here that we should we should not lose sight of that actually Latifi may have been the most important F1 driver of the last 10 years. Not the best, not the best, but important. I will not say important. Influential. Oh, I will subscribe to that. Yes, he is the most influential driver of the last 10 years. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% correct. Nobody put their finger on races as much as Nicholas Latifi did. Indeed. Those scales with that little little finger of his, they were changed. It changed It changed the course of F1 history. I mean, how many safety cars brought out that had different strategy changes? You know, e- even not even talking about Abu Dhabi in 2021, like... There are so many Nicholas Latifi moments of that. That's right up there with, uh, you know, Lance Stroll of, oh yeah, I can stay out on these tires and then sliding into the wall in Russia. Um, like so many Nicholas Latifi moments like that. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, MBA from London Business School. You know, maybe he's going on the uh, the Toto Wolf track of I can't be a good racer. I'm going to own my own team. Maybe, maybe it is. Is it? It's interesting to reflect that Alonso is the chaos machine in F1, but only for driver seats. Like he's usually not a chaos machine on the track. But Latifi plays played that same role as the chaos machine that gave us exciting F1. And that's why this season hasn't been as exciting, because we no longer have Latifi. Oh, man, just think of a world in like 10, 15 years time where um, Fernando Alonso is like the Helmet Marco character and Latifi is the Toto Wolf character and they like team up together. Oh, that would be that would be glorious. I mean, well, Nikki Lauda, Nikki Lauda was, Lauda was kind of doing that. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say Helmet Marco. Maybe I should say Nikki Lauda. I could, I could, I could subscribe to that. And he will buy Williams off the private investment firm because then he'll convince his dad it's a tax writer. There you go. Uh, shall we do our occasional segment about does Blank have a job? Well, some of them don't, so I think we definitely should. They don't. Yes, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come straight out here, and I would like to point out that I had originally. We had previously discussed putting Mr. Debris at the bottom because it was clearly he was going to get fired at some point. But what was the point in keep talking about him? I had preemptively moved him to the bottom because of that. But then I moved him to the top because there were strong rumors that he was about to get fired. And then he did. Uh, And so Nick, not here to joke around Debris, in fact, was joking around and no longer has a driver. Uh, Did you see uh, Yuki's comments about uh, Debris? That he had, he was a good driver. No, that that apparently he was giving like Nikki Lauda in rush style feedback and debriefs of like, oh yes, the left side of the front wing is clearly what's slowing the car down, and Yuki was just like really taken aback by this. And I'm wondering if he was, just, I'm wondering if he was just full of crap. Very interesting. It's an easy, way, it's easy way for someone, you know, what's the phrase? Um, bad workman blames his tools. And maybe that's what he was trying to do. He was projecting that his front left, e.g., his breaking foot. Uh, was broken and needed some extra work. Well, thinking back to the movie Rush, uh, Nikki Lauda talking about that in real life is when Nikki told old man Ferrari how shitty his Ferrari was. Uh, Ferrari said, "What do you need to do to fix it?" And it, what and you know how much faster will you go if I fix it? And he said, "You know, if you fix this, it'll be like six tenths quicker." And he goes, "Okay, we'll do it. And if it's not, you're fired." So. Maybe it was the same situation of Nick said, oh, this needs to be fixed. All right. How much? Two tenths. Nope. You're gone. Are you placing uh, Nick Debris on the same pedestal as Nicky Lauda? No, 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 I'm not because Nicky could deliver and Nick couldn't. Fair. I will concede that point. It, it's a great, it's a great trick when you can pull it off. If you can't pull it off, you're lousy. Uh, next on the list, uh, unless you have anything more to add about Mr. Debris. Nope. We can stop talking about him for forever. Indeed. Uh, so Otmar, uh, I had originally written this as, yes, he is good and still has a job because they fired his boss's boss instead. Uh, didn't see that coming, thought it was a good idea. But then we have the race and admittedly through no fault of his own, but two of his cars didn't finish again. Well, when you turn one into a lawnmower, like that's really not on the team principle. What's he going to say? Not Don't mow the grass? Like... True, and I think he is still safe, but I think he needs to, he needs to have a really good result next week in um, Spa. He I has th- to, like. I think it depends on who uh, Renault is going to replace with their CEO. No, they've replaced him already. The CEO? They got the new guy. No, I know, yeah. but but it, I think it's really going to depend like how he feels about the Alpine team, how he feels about Otmar's direction, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't think... I think it's one of those... Um, we were right in sniffing out that somebody was going to lose their job at the top, and we just had the wrong person right now. But that being said, that doesn't necessarily mean that they won't bring in somebody else. Yeah. I, so it'll be interesting to see. It's interesting to think about the summer break where they're not supposed to work on the cars and they're not supposed to do any F1 stuff when everybody takes a vacation. If you're Otmar and you're the new CEO, do you be like, nope, we need the management team. They're coming in. We're going for a two-week off-site discuss about how things happen. And that's really the litmus test to find out whether he keeps his job or not. No, it's a, yeah, it's a corporate retreat. We are going on vacation. Uh, next, Lance uh, narrowly avoids another penalty in quality for impeding Bottas. I thought that was classic, classic, like Lance impeding everybody because he does it all the time. And then where was he in the race? Nowhere, nowhere. Right behind Alonso. True, but I, I think that was through through luck, let's be clear. Yeah. You know, so, you know, just looking at the, the current standings and the, particularly in the constructors, like Aston Martin's on 184, Alonso's on 139. You know, I think it's very clear that like Mercedes is pulling into two, but like Ferrari can pass Aston for three. And like, 
how much of the like they're only what it's 184 to 167 it's all to play for and the mclarens are at 87 coming on strong so you were, we're realistically saying Aston could be down to the fifth fastest car by the end of the season and you think of how many missed opportunities they had at the start of the season with lance and it's it's all fine if you're you know if you're still at the top on or of a standing, but if you're sliding back and it's like, Hmm, one of our drivers has 80% of our points. That's not good for your job, bud. No. I mean, uh... if, if in our work, if we, if uh, one team member did 80% of the work of another t- or of the team, that 20% team member is probably not hanging around very long. Oh yeah. I, I have, I have, as, as a former people manager, I have had lo- long conversations with managers about the, uh, uh, you've, you've got one person who's underperforming. Um, what do you do about that? And would you rather take a new hire and maybe take a risk on them? And it's a diff- it's it's difficult, uh, especially when uh, your dad owns the team. <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, one last thing on that. You got to remember that now that Aston Martin's in bed with Honda, Yuki is coming for Lance's seat. So, got to remember that. Uh, anyway, uh, Ferrari. I think we should not talk about them here. We'll leave that for the race recap. Oh, jeez. You agree? Uh, yes, because I don't think anybody at Ferrari can actually be fired because the level of incompetence they continue to show shows that they will never change leadership. So we should just never talk about anybody in Ferrari on should they lose their job because the answer is yes, but it's not going to happen. Fair. I will concede that. Uh, swiftly moving on, Logan Sargent. Uh, oh man, he's no Latifi, but at the same time, I feel bad for him because he's he's. It, it, He's been paired with what I think is actually a really good reference for him and someone who can be supportive and who isn't trying to kill you because they've got their uh, position cemented and I, he just doesn't seem to be able to get it and I feel bad for him. I mean, as much as I don't really like him, but... Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd rather see Alexander Rossi in an F1 seat than Logan Sargent, but whatever. Or Joseph Newgarden if we're going to throw any American in. Um, yeah, uh, and I think Alex Albon is... I think he's hustling around that Williams more than that Williams is able to go um yes i don't think hungary was ever going to be a good track for that car um but i think alex is proving he got a really raw deal on the red bull thing and he is actually a driver worthy of being on the grid and that's not good for logan indeed and i i i wonder with the recent improvements that williams has made and the the the, the song coming from the team that actually this could be alex's opportunity to pull off something that so rarely happens, which is join a team, prove yourself that you're really good and help the team rebuild and then come out smelling of roses, which does not happen very often. You normally move to a team after you've proven your true worth. Uh, next on the list, Perez. Uh, after that qualifying debacle, hell no. I think I may have left that in from the last time. It wasn't that bad of qualifying. I think it was still a debacle. I think it was still a debacle though, because like he should not be in P9. No, he shouldn't. He really, really, really shouldn't. Yeah, we'll talk. Uh, well, we can mention a little bit in quality, but like Red Bull clearly said they had set their car up for the race, not qualifying, because apparently at Hungary, like that's a very big track of they're a little bit different setups. So they they could have just gave up on us. <laughs> they know their car is so fast, they just didn't care about quality and set it up totally for the race. Um, that can forgive Perez a little bit, but no, you need to be up there, bud. Uh, there is another level here that I think could be dangerous for Perez. Uh, you know, Red Bull is clearly going to be running against the cost cap with all the extra sandwiches and pies that they've been buying. Um, and he crashed that car pretty bad in FP1. They, there is meaningful amount of dollars in that. I haven't looked at the World Construct- World Destructors Championship, but that's 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 an impact on the budget that should not be underestimated. Oh man, we didn't even talk about the three teams that have been rumored to overrun the cost cap in our between race drama. The FIA have just come out right before recording saying that it is all rumors and not a single team has been informed about their status on certification. Um, didn't they say that last year too? Uh, possibly, but it probably means someone in the FIA is leaking like a sieve. Oh no, a massive organization like that having leaks? I'm surprised. It's very shocking. Uh, last person, do they still have a job? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting a new entrant in here, uh, Yuki. Uh, not because he's been doing particularly bad, but now... He's got the risk that he's got a, a benchmark to drive against, and I will talk about um, Mr. Ricardo's dri- race performance shortly. Um, but I do think that is a definitely should be on the watch list for Yuki. I think it really depends on what happens in the next few races or not. Yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think sadly Yuki's ever going to get promoted to the main Red Bull seat. I think you're much more likely to see Perez hang on to it for a while or it go to Danny Rick. Um, that being said, I think maybe Yuki could be a great person to either replace Lance or maybe Williams becomes the wayward home for former Red Bull drivers who are desperate to reprove themselves. Could be, especially if he if he loses the seat this year because Red Bull want to put 
Liam Lawson in the seat and then um, Logan Sargent gets kicked out, maybe maybe that's what Williams ends up doing. They sign a second deal with Honda. The second car company for the Honda. You know, Liam Lawson and Daniel Ricciardo would not be a bad 2024 pairing for AlphaTauri. No, it would be really interesting. That would be, but that would be, that would be really good for Liam because he's got a very good driver across from him to kind of learn from, mentor a little bit. And that would, I think that would be a very, that'd be a very good fit. That's, that's not a very tinfoil helmets y take, but I think it would be a very good fit. Like if I, if I'm Helmet Marco, I'd do that. Should we go into quality recap? Uh, absolutely. I did. I will say I did watch quality with the sound off, so I'm not entirely sure of everything that happened. But I did watch quality. I did not listen to quality. I watched quality. I don't think you missed very much by not listening to. It. Uh, well, George just like <laughs> eight p eighteen. George, come on, man. That was really bad, and he tried to blame the team afterwards. And I understand that the team had a significant component in maybe putting him in a, making it harder for him to capitalize. But if you watch the, if you watch closely, there was a number of replays they showed of this. He basically lets everybody go past and doesn't like. He's on the penultimate, thing, he's on the last corner to turn up to go for a full run, and he just lets everybody go past. Not like he wasn't paying attention. He's like, oh, I don't want to hit anybody. I don't want to hit anybody, which he is very good at, and then just didn't get the momentum and he screwed it up. So I think yes, the team is partially at fault, but also I think George really should have capitalized on that. Are you telling me that George, everything is not my fault, wasn't that fault, according to George? Correct. I am, in fact, saying that. Maybe somebody needs to give George a PowerPoint presentation. You know, a language he understands of how he has been at fault in some of these situations. <laughs> Do you think he ever opens Excel, look at his lap times? Oh, I would hope so. And I hope he's got a pretty graph of it. And he, like, plots them every week and he puts them in his own personal spreadsheet. You can look back at them and see how good he did. Uh, if anybody in the Microsoft marketing department is listening, because there is a small chance that might actually be true, um, uh, Mercedes, George Russell, that could be a great Office 360 uh, partnership sponsorship deal. The problem is, is they sponsor uh, Alpine. <sighs> no comment. All right. Uh, Ferrari on Ferrari drama. Just think that, do they pay for that? Or does Alpine pay them for that? Like, how does that go? I don't know. At this point, I feel like just, you know, some free, th- some three Office 365 subscriptions. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, Ferrari on Ferrari drama. I do remember this, but I can't remember the specifics. Uh, so it was touch and go with uh, both uh, Charles and Carlos of who was going to be P10 and who was going to be P11. <laughs> so one of them kicked the other out. I remember that now. And they were like, are we going to do this? And then they just Ferrari'd it because they've got a number one driver and a number two driver. And Carlos is not the number yeah. one driver. We, we've mentioned it. Perez, like kind of skating through. And then, you know, he was actually looking okay at the top of the time sheets in Q1 and Q2 and then q3 comes and he's ninth it was interesting they kept talking about his uh on the commentating that you did not hear that he always goes early in each of the sessions and i actually don't remember that he really does that he's only been doing it recently when he's been screwing up yeah so if you're screwing up let's let the tires cool down for two minutes before the light goes green yeah good plan that's a like i like it i like it that's a good strategy that's a galaxy brain strategy hey but both of the alphas made it into q3 that was pretty cool they they did, and uh, Guan Yu Zhou made it to uh, P5, which was actually really pretty good. I, I've been reflecting on the quali and trying to work out whether cars improved, e.g. it was a track that suited the Alpha, which I think was plausible. But I think I think the, the tire allocation, which you've got a point about somewhere else, I think it created the jeopardy situation that you get with um, a drying track in qualifying so where it's wet and then the track changes and it's like it's last one through wins um and i think that's really what happened i think it was the the mercedes or the mclarens were very impressive because like you know you think silverstone is a very different sort of race circuit than hungary and the fact that they were able to take it to the red bulls specifically one red bull two weekends in a row on very different tracks i think is very telling that their upgrades are working very well yes and it was it was with confidence it was not luck there was it was it was they did it they executed it and they were pretty successful what did you think of the uh alternate tire allocation uh qualifying the right way for me to say this is i think it's fine and it will take time for teams to adjust but at this track it as i just said i think it created a drying track situation and i don't like those because it just makes it messes everything up and it's not really predictable and it's not it's not that i want it to be predictable but i want the performance to be representative of the of the capabilities of the team and the driver and what happens is, is you just put a random number generator in to mix it up and you don't really know who's doing what anymore all right so yeah i guess the alphas kind of ended up out of place but that's about it everybody else was kind of where they should have been was lewis supposed to be on pole i think 
so there was a comment made during the race, I think, by Martin, Martin Brundle of uh, essentially that was not Mercedes is a pole lap kind of setting car. That was a Lewis Hamilton pole lap. I would agree with that. A- and given he has nine poles at Hungary, more than any driver at Hungary, more than any driver on any track, that is a track that he knows how to hook up. He knows very well. And I, I think I, I think it's a totally deserving Lewis Hamilton on pole. It was great to see. But I think that was a Lewis Hamilton pole lap, not a Mercedes pole lap. I, I will subscribe to that. I am disappointed that to preview the race recap uh, that he didn't capitalize on that. But I don't think it's as technically disappointing as it turned out to be. Well, let's go. Let's go into the race recap. Um, yeah. Uh, Lewis led for... 50, 50 meters? Um, but my, my take here is is that I think Lewis misjudged his whole race strat. Um, I saw some post-race interviews that I read uh, just before we started recording where he talked about the, the simulations and his expectations. were no, He did not think he could get higher than third but would like to have been fighting for it. So maybe this is, I'm being overly harsh, but he made a choice to defend against Max into basically the, the first corner and I think that was a mistake. He should have just let Max go straight past him set his car up for a position, and then maintain second. I think, I don't know whether he would have maintained for the whole race. I think you could also see a little bit of this later in the race when it was, I think it was Perez, Piastri, Norris, Verstappen. Oh, sorry, it was Perez, Hamilton, Piastri, Norris, and Verstappen. And Perez was coming right up behind him and eating his time. And he kept trying to defend against Perez, slowing him down from Piastri. He should have let Perez go straight through because he knew he wasn't going to be able to successfully defend and then followed Perez all the way through. It would have meant he could have possibly got... Well, Perez could have got Norris and then he would have been able to follow behind and, take, and end up in third. But instead he tried to defend and I think he chewed a little bit of his tires and blah, 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 and the timing wasn't right. I feel like it was like, instead of trying to keep like the position that he had, he should have turned that into an acceptable loss to gain a position later. But who am I as a F1 driving strategist? Uh, now, granted, we are two white guys on a podcast, but I think you are a fine F1 driving strategist. I don't think you are a good F1 driver, uh, to borrow a word from a cycling coach I once had of win, crash, or DQ. <laughs> I, I don't think there is any any spot in Lewis's mindset of, I will race for second today. I will race for third today. Lewis is going to go for the win. And I would accept that on the first corner, but the Perez, like two thirds of the way through the race, he should have been realizing that he could have got third if he changed his strategy. But instead he was trying to protect fourth against Perez. And I think he thought he was he was fighting for fourth when he should have changed it and been fighting for third in a different way. Maybe he just didn't want to be shown up by Lando on the podium again of not being able to do the champagne. Uh... And yeah, he did. That That was very weak sauce last week. He looked so disappointed when he just like smashed it on the thing and nothing happened. It happens. This happens to people all the time. I'm sure if uh, he was still working with Angela, she would have brought like, you know, 20 bottles of champagne around and just like Lewis would have been like, again, another and like practicing all week to be ready to do it. Exactly. Maybe maybe it's because he wasn't expecting to be on the podium and he didn't practice. There you go. There you go. That Yeah, he he, he didn't have time to practice. So he, he went for fourth. Uh, but yeah. I like that. Decided to get fourth so he didn't have a champagne problem. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> George had a decent drive through the field. He did. He ended he up did. what? Uh, P6? That's not bad. For starting 18th? Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, apparently, the other headline I saw right before this was apparently he beat his simulation. The simulations that Red Bull had run. Not Red Bull had run. Uh, Mercedes had run, um, had showed that he would oh. not make it that high. So he's faster than So he's faster than Mick Schumacher, huh? Exactly. That's what we can take away from that. Um, you've got some other comments here about the Mercedes, about it not running the heat, like in the heat. Oh yeah, it, 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 I mean, it was a warm day. It was like what, 53 C? Something like that. But then it ran out of fuel. Like as the fuel load lowered, both of those cars, like, boom, they were on the game. They were making great progress against the Red Bulls. Well, yeah, when you're, uh, when you're lighter, you're, when you're lighter, you're not putting as much energy through the tires and the brakes. Indeed, indeed. But it was interesting that it was so stark, like he was barely keeping up. And then suddenly it was like, I'm dropping a second lap. It's great. Um, I think that explains a lot about the qualifying performance because they would have fueled it lightly. So. But but I think also like the Mercedes has always had problems with heat. Um, you know, you, you think even in the old formula, uh, like there were a couple of years in Mexico where it's like, oh, you're at altitude and hot. They're not doing well. Um, and it, yeah, heat's just always been a weakness for the Mercedes cars and still is. I will concur with that. Would you like to talk about Ferrari? 
Does anybody ever want to talk about Ferrari? Ferrari fans. That's true. Um, do they hate both of their drivers? Yes. Like, that's the only thing I can think of at this point in time. Because Carlos had a brilliant start on the soft tire. You know, he he's starts P11, uh, Leclerc starts P6. And, like, within, what, two or three laps, Carlos is on Charles's gearbox. And then proceeds to, like, burn out his soft tires. Like, they didn't let carlos go through because he's the number two driver sure sure um and then you know he's like hey i want to wait until pit until it looks like perez is just about to overtake me essentially can i slow perez down and like minimize my sort of time and then like he immediately gets called into box like they're because it's like yep copy we got you that's a great plan so not only do the ferrari drivers have to do their own race engineering their race engineering isn't even listened to like man and then and then, th- then when that that pit stop cycled around, Charles got a nine point four second pit stop, like <laughs> to be then behind signs. Um, yeah, it's just I-, I said this before in previous episodes, and I deeply believe it. Ferrari hires drivers to drive the car. They do not see them as a member of the team. They don't see them as integral to their success, other than you've got to have a driver to drive the car around, otherwise the car's going nowhere. Like, that is their philosophy, and they treat their drivers exactly like that. You follow the program, and you do what it says, right? I don't care what your feelings are, because you're just a driver. You're just you're just a meat bag in the thing turning the steering wheel. You know, that, that makes a lot of sense, given uh, the greatest question ever in an F1 press conference of, you know, a short view back to the past. Nikki Lauda said, put a trained monkey in the car. He can do what I do. Ferrari believe their drivers are just trained monkeys. That's why Nikki. That's why Nikki said it then. Exactly. That is fundamentally Ferrari's belief, and it's a hundred percent flawed. And I will still go down as that is the best question ever asked in an F one press conference. It was a. It was a really good question that like nobody took seriously, and that bothered me because like it was a very good question. And here we are, and nobody's willing to ask the hard questions anymore. Uh, I did. I did take away one upside from Ferrari's um, inability to do the right thing. Uh, It teaches Ferrari drivers uh, to be strategists because they have to make the strategy up as they go along. And it teaches them because they have to try really hard. They can't just YOLO it. You have to think really hard, which means when they eventually leave Ferrari, if they ever get to another good team, they're like an amazing driver. Like they are the driver you want because they've got they've got strategy in their head. They don't have to deal with adverse situations. It's amazing. But nobody ever leaves Ferrari and goes anywhere else. They'll leave Ferrari and give up. Because they've been broken. They're 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 great at those uh, those behavioral questions of tell me about a time when you faced uh, <laughs> you faced adversity and overcame it. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's beautiful. Uh, I love well, that. That's fantastic. Well, when I was a driver for Ferrari, <laughs> yeah, I have many situations. What was the what was the most difficult time in your career as an F1 driver? My entire time at Ferrari. <laughs> tell me about a time you had a conflict with leadership and how you resolved it. <laughs> A time I was in conflict the in the entire duration. There was no other time, like like this race weekend or any race weekend. Exactly. Uh, you want to talk about Alpine? Uh, sure. Uh, I I think we should be yeah. We we got to be very brief about this because I don't want to spend more time talking about Alpine than they spent in the race. Um, yeah. Gasly decided he wanted to mow the grass, and but it wasn't Gasly's fault. No, it was right? it was Zhao's he, bad start. It was Joe's fault. It was absolutely his fault. Uh, and I feel I feel for Gasly and Ocon because it was because Gwen Yu Joe hit Ocon, who then took out Gasly, and Ricardo got tangled up in that. And moving along, moving along. Uh, so Red Bull, uh, you have a proposal about some secret spicy things that, he, that was going on here. Yeah, I think if Prez is going to qualify out of position, I think they put him on the hard tire because I don't think anybody really got good hard tire data running throughout the weekend. So if Prez is going to drive like a crap driver, we're going to put him on the hard tire to start with, so we know what tire what strategy we should go with Max for because he's going to win stuff. And Prez is if whatever Prez does is a bonus at this point. So until until uh, until qualifying until your qualifying position improves the beatings with crappy tires to test it out for Max will continue. I mean, Max is still leading the driver's championship or the constructor's championship on his own. It's still close, isn't it, though? It's close. Uh, 281 to 223. It's, it's, two, oh, yeah, it's two race wins. Close. So if Max decides he wants a vacation, it's not a problem. Uh, anything else to say about Red Bull? Uh, uh, they, they were good. Um, there was a great, there was a great um, 
I think Max is having a lot of fun this season because what else can he do? Um, he is he's clearly joking around in all the press conferences and stuff. Somebody asked him about like, oh yeah, you're starting P two. It's like, well, I've started P ten. That's a lot worse. <laughs> like. <laughs> He also went and put in a banger fastest lap in the race. Like, it was two seconds faster than the next next close. Yeah, and, and then I believe the commentary was, now how are Red Bull going to keep him entertained for the next 20 laps? <laughs> I, I will say, if you take Max out of this championship, it's a really great championship. Because now you've got Mercedes and McLaren coming up. You have Aston Martin falling back through the field. Ferrari are doing Ferrari things. Um, yeah, if you take Max out, this is a brilliant season. Yes, I would agree with that. And everybody's closed up. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Um, yeah. Should you talk about McLaren? The, the upgrades they are working. Good. The drivers are working. Yeah. yeah. Teams working two-second pit stop. That's pretty good. Yeah. I, I think... Not quite the Red Bulls 1.9, but pretty good. Yeah. Well, yeah. The 1.9 was in the old rules where, like... No, no. Perez got a 1.9 today. Oh, he did? They're back under two? <laughs> Amazing to think how quick they'd be if the uh, FIA didn't put that rule in place about, like, safe pit stops. So they'd be down to, like, 1.5. That would be very impressive. I I will say that, uh, we talked about it last week, but I think it's true, Merck need to spend time on their pits. They have to get those back. They need to get them under sub 2.2, really. And they need to be close to, like, 2.1. They really need to fix that. They they But they've never been good at the pit stops. They've always been, like, it's always been, like, 2.8, and we're just not going to screw up. We're not going to lose time. And I think the problem is, is they are losing time because of that. Yeah, uh, definitely. But like going back to the old formula, it was Mercedes was so dominant. It was, we just don't want like the 10 second stop. And Red Bull was looking for every advantage of like, if we can take half a second out of them, like that could be big on an undercut situation. And yeah, and and, that, and I think it's bleeding over to the fact of McCle- or, uh, Mercedes just has slow pit stops. And they're still in this like, Two eight is fine. We it'll it's not bad. It's not good. It's fine. And Red Bull just takes so much pride, and we are going to get these cars in and out. And it plays into Merck's strategy. If you watched in the race, they just left Lewis hanging out at the front in P two forever on the side. I understand some of the reasons why, but I'm like no, safety no, no, car no. window. I, I and I know that safety cars could happen, but like I feel like they were making some poor choices again because I think they think that the car that it's not that they think the car is a great car it's that their mentality is still dictated by seven years of success we can only hope that red bull ends up falling into the same trap in 2027 uh i would say that like it might be the case of um what am i thinking i forget uh (laughs) it might just be the case of okay no i really lost that thought uh I, i will say though it is interesting that i believe perez tends to have faster pit stops than max I think for almost the same reason, like Perez is hovering right around like two o. Max is usually around two three, two four, and I think it's one of those, you know, let's not screw up Max's race. Like we need to gain time with Perez, but we we just need to let Max, you know, if, if we're if we're a tenth slower, that's as long as we get it right. Especially when you're twenty seconds in front. Yeah, you don't want to waste those twenty seconds in the pits. Exactly. They've learned from Monaco that one year. Alfatori. Uh. Daniel beat Yuki. He did, and I missed that happening. I was watching his position, and he was well behind Yuki by like six positions. And then something happened, and I don't think Danny went forward really quickly. I don't, I, I don't think so anyway. I, I think he did an alternate tire strategy that just started to work out. Yes, he I think he you pitted. Are he his last pit stop came early, and I think that allowed him to drive faster in clean air. And then when everybody else did their second pit stop, he he then moved up he kind of got thrown out of position like because he was caught up behind the alpines going exploring at the end of turn one In, and indeed. That i thought these races over at that point yeah i i can't believe he escaped that with that without any damage yeah i was surprised it looked like he had hit like his front wing definitely got a twang but apparently nothing fell off yeah uh, and it uh, was oscar piastri's comment apparently because he got his front wing dinged at some point and he was blaming he had car damage i'm not sure i believe that uh he danny's diffuser did get hit he got he got rear-ended by joe yes but I was talking about Piastri. Right, yeah, I'm just saying, like, Daniel did probably have some damage, but not, like, major damage. He was doing really well right like, the last 15 laps or so. You could see he was pulling away from Hulkenberg and making inroads, not as fast as maybe to be able to overtake him. Uh, and he was doing pretty good. Like, it, 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 was a, it was a good recovery drive, but in both senses of recovery from the lawnmower incident with the Alpines and recovery for his career. 
yeah, I, I think I think Danny's looking good. Real test is going to be next week. I think he likes Spa too. Yeah, he he needs to he needs to be matching Yuki in his um, qualifying and practice times. I think next week really cement his position. I think uh, more appropriately, Yuki needs to be matching Daniel because he was because Daniel made it Q two. Yuki was out in Q one. Daniel beat him in the race. But I, I still think that that was part of the random number generator, the, the alternative tire. We'll see We'll see next weekend when we have a more traditional tire strat. Indeed. Aston? Is, is Aston, yeah, are they the fifth best car now? Uh, the media, based on the headline I saw just before recording, um, says yes, they are in fact the fifth best car. That's a fall. It is a fall. In hindsight, if you're, if you're, if you're writing the PowerPoint presentation to show to uh, Daddy Stroll, you'll be like, look how bad we were last year. Look where we are now. We're fifth. Our work and your investment has paid off. Is, is this one of those you just need to read the y-axis on the graph to go see what the true story is? This is actually, as I talk about it, it's a very similar fall from grace uh, for as Ferrari had last year. Came out of the gate, working really well, and then whatever reason, they're clearly not screwing up like Ferrari has, but the upgrades or changes that they've done in the car are either bad or just not working. Um, it's, it's, it's disappointing. I did like... Um, fernando defending against perez before he gave up because i'm like uh, fernando will defend for last place like it's the last thing in the world no matter where he is in the field he will always try and i was hoping he was going to hold up perez because i don't like perez yeah uh i think fernando drove fine stroll came home with the point like but overall that was a weekend to forget if you're an aston martin fan it was two weekends to forget if you're an aston martin fan oh man they're limping into the summer break it's not looking good indeed i'm I'm hope i'm I'm hoping they stop going backwards and establish a more solid performance because continuing to go backwards is bad i wonder how much maybe 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 it's a strategy it's about getting the wind tunnel time yes tank for tunnel time uh i i I think it's I wonder how much they're just being outdeveloped because like... But why would they be outdeveloped? They've got the engineer, they've got the money, and they've got the tools. See, you need the engineers, plural. They only have one. Yeah. It's just one guy with a, with a bit of carbon weave trying to hope that it works and put it in his microwave to cure it. <laughs> yeah, man, that's how that's how carbon fiber works. Exactly. Uh, should we talk about the remaining three teams very briefly by mentioning their names and then moving on because they're forgettable in every possible way? Uh, I think I think Bottas had a pretty good drive. Um, Did he? He was out qualified by uh, Guan Joe, and then only because Guan Yu Joe drove into the back of everybody else was he in front of. Uh, was, he, was he just not looking at the lights? How do you have a start that I bad? I don't know. It was really bad. I I was like, what the hell? It was like one of those where you're stopped at a stoplight and you just kind of like daydreaming for a little bit and suddenly you notice all the cars around you are moving and you're like, oh, crap, green. Like, that's how bad it was. Very bad. It was very strange. I was I was surprised when I saw the car leap out around him. I'm like, what happened? Somebody stalled it on the grid? But no, apparently not. Maybe it did hit anti-stall and it just really thought about it when i saw because that was valtteri that popped out i thought it was another uh valtteri god reaction well when was the last time you had one of the the time in uh, uh austria where it's technically not a jump start but his reaction time was like point zero 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 one. i remember that now you're like that's like that is comically quick it's like yes te- technically you moved after the lights went out but like we're taking the speed of light into account. Like literally there was no way for, I think there was actually like analysis done. That was like, there is no way he could have seen the lights go out and react it. Like the neurons do not fire fast enough in your brain for you to do this. Uh, but, but the rule is not lights go out plus some reaction time. The rule is lights go out, car go fast. And there's actually, there's actually this, not to segue off of a Formula One podcast into like science, but there is actually like a scientific thing of like they only hold the lights on for like a certain period of time, like one to what five seconds or something, like one to three seconds. And it's the same thing in long track speed skating of like the longer they hold you, the more likely you are to get a faster start because you, you know that where the finite end is. So you uh, can actually anticipate the start. Interesting. Yeah interesting so this like we have a random start of like it's going to be a random amount of time actually the longer you hold them the more likely it is you can guess when the start's going to be because you've you've just taken out this time you know it's not does that apply across the whole field so that if you look at the times when it has been held longer everybody's reaction time is statistically speaking 
faster than it is when they hold when it ends up being held for a short that would be very interesting if somebody had all the data on that i would love to look indeed. at that i assume f1 must have it somewhere i wonder if we could write to i wonder if we could write to f1 and ask for that data you can try we could try yeah hey we're doing some yeah science i'm just curious do you happen to have all the how long you hold the button for versus like driver reaction times you know all the, the random stat stuff that they do on reddit i think the stats are available publicly i don't know where you might have to wait for them to become available but i think they are available you should go dig that out because you're the statistician here not me that's true uh not not technically though but yes uh take that aws insights boom should we talk about williams no okay should we talk about Haas? definitely not i'm nico hulkenberg did go into q3 and then proceeded to always drive backwards uh yeah that's about it yeah he's so good at it that's what he does just because the car eats tires. It's, 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 it's like the cookie monster, but for tires. Nom, 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 nom. Uh, I, I will ask one Haas-related question. Did they do the right thing by dropping Mick Schumacher? Given, given his wisdom in the uh, Mercedes simulation. I don't know. I think the answer is for Haas, yes. I think Haas made the right choice. Because they're not running it to be a successful team they're running it so that gene has can say he has an f1 team all right spicy takes and rumors definitely um pirelli mid-season tire changes suck i think they so? i think they've unintentionally alonzo was saying that he thinks it's nuked for, uh red bull and aston it nuked red bull he is watching the same motorsport we are right he said it after quali so i think in terms of quali yes it did nuke red bull uh but we also talked about red bull set up their car for the race not quali um but i think it is possible it nuked aston um because if you're if you're you're given these tires in preseason testing you can collect loads of data on how these tires run how they adapt to your car you develop a title model a tire model for your data um your statistical analysis your cfd models everything like that and then they go and change the tires on you mid-season and you don't get like a tire testing day to like truly run and explore all the tires to see where the changes are. Cause that was not the point of the Pirelli tire test on the Tuesday after Silverstone. If you don't have that sort of mid season test, like you could find out that you're developing the car in a direction that is not going to pan out well with these tires. And you're not going to know until you show up to the race weekend. The problem with his assertion there is that it seems like Aston Martin is the only team that's really been, yeah, but I don't know. There was a couple years ago, I think maybe 2019, 2018, 2019, where they changed the the layup mid-season to like a thinner tire and it like brought the mercs even more alive and i don't disagree with the sentiment and i also don't disagree with the feeling that maybe they shouldn't be changing the the compounds mid-season but i'm not sure i'm willing to go with did they screw it yet i i I accept your spicy take but i'm not willing to subscribe yeah i it's just i don't think it's great for it's very interesting given that you had um the fia president mohammed what's his name uh i don't want to get the wrong one uh, yeah uh we'll just call him by his actual first name which is muhammad uh because and i just don't want to say the wrong surname because one of them's a crown prince of saudi arabia and one of them's a fia president so we'll just stick with that uh, <laughs> no comment no comment um but he was saying you know it's it's not the fia's job to try to pin back one team and I think that's very much true, but this is like an interesting loophole of like, yes, we are not going to change the rules to pin back Red Bull, but if Pirelli was to change the tires a little bit, like... I'm not going to object. Yeah. We didn't change the rules. Yeah, I, it, it, I think it's difficult to make that call yet. I think we've had two race, two qualifying sessions that have been mixed up separate from the compound. We had the drying track in silverstone and we had the alternative minimum tax i mean sorry alternative tire allocation this week and i think that just confuses the situation um but but we did ask the question of like has mclaren just really nailed the upgrades because their performance has also coincided exactly with pirelli bringing the new tires oh now that's an interesting spicy take i will subscribe to that that asked that that mclaren actually didn't really improve their car but the car works better with those tires that would also fit with the fact that the mclaren lost its performance towards the end of the race today yeah i i do think i do think mclaren improved their car but i think it's also one of those things like they improved their car and the tire changes that came in it just like it turned it into a rocket ship because how do you go from like what they were like 17 six they were the back of the grid to now suddenly the front of the grid like that is just not heard of in the modern f1 stuff even like before the budget cap of like 
you know, you had unlimited tunnel testing time, you had unlimited budget. Nobody was jumping suddenly like half the grid up or the whole grid up. Here is a real spicy take. I love when we tee off of each other. Okay, this is a brilliant spicy take. The reason James Key was fired was not because of his lack of performance to develop the car. It's because it's Spygate 2.0 and they found out he'd stolen information slash been slipped information from Red Bull because that's where he came from. And that's why they got rid of him lickety split as part of a backroom deal with the FIA. I could see that. There you go. Let's see what happens. Is he by any chance now working for Pirelli? No, he is uh, going to work for Sauber. That that would be perfect, though, if now we ended up at uh, Pirelli and was, like, backdooring information to McLaren there. Indeed, that'd be very suspicious. We, we'd really um, have the, the full gambit of uh, craziness. The next spicy hot take, Daniel Ricciardo and Pierre Gasly are the same. Now, do you mean that just because one of them is driving a metaphorical lawnmower and one of them is driving an actual lawnmower? No. Okay. That is not what I mean. I mean, if you go back and you look over their performance and their career and where they end up playing, they've ended up in the same teams after they've left Red Bull. So Gasly has the has the return redemption arc after he passes through McLaren and ends up back at AlphaTauri in a few years' time. But I was looking back at the results, and while I think Danny had some uh, better wins, I think it was actually less to do with him being a winner, and it was he was in the right place at the right time, so that his skills of being a winner were able to be capitalized. Whereas when um, Pierre Gasly was in a Red Bull, he wasn't able to capitalize on it because the car was a bit crap back then. And that's really what's going on. I mean, I think the car was also a bit crap when Danny was winning uh, for Red Bull as well. Because there, there was definitely some Danny being at the right place at the right times. Monaco. Well, he, he was also at the wrong place at the wrong time in Monaco that one year. Uh, also true. Well, really just the tire was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Wow, we've referenced that twice in one podcast. That's impressive. Um, well, the, the only thing, the only way I'll push back against that is uh, Ricardo took over from mark weber was placed against a four-time world champion in a team that loved him and favored him and beat him in the first season fair i will concede that point uh my last spicy take is i'm getting very annoyed with headlines on the f1 media uh, there were two stories from the same interview uh about hamilton talking about how he feels like he's really getting back into it with the car and his qualifying was performance was the first time in a year and a half where he felt the confidence in the car and he just was willing to do it and he wanted to send it um we had one uh news outlet which i will not name um that decided to say hamilton stark admission over f1 performance uh and then proceeds to cobble together quotes that look like lewis is saying like basically i've lost it which is certainly one take um, the alternative headline was saying Hamilton says he's back to his best, which I think is a more factually accurate and less judgy take on what was said. Uh, this is not going to be a reflection on you, but I just have to ask the question. Did you click through to both of these articles? Yes, I read both of them. Then the headlines did their job, job Dominic. You got the clicks Fair through. Point. You, you, are, you are the problem, sir. You are clicking through and driving their headlines to be this way. That's my spicy take. But because I'm a terrible person, they didn't get any ad revenue because they had an ad blocker enabled. <laughs> Perfect. Should we move on to wrap up and crazy but plausible predictions for Spa? Yeah, somehow we've talked for like an hour about a race that like was kind of, it wasn't great. Qualifying was good because Lewis got them pole, but that's it really. Yeah. Uh, Red Bull broke McLaren's record for longest win streak uh, for, by a constructor. I'm still not sure how I feel about that. Not, not, not from a significance perspective. I assert the significance, but I, I, I feel there's a there's a percentage win ratio aspect here. I, I honestly, and I, this is going to be like crap for Formula One, but I really want them to win every race this season and just put that record on a shelf. Yes, I agree. I wholly agree. If they're going to do it, that would be the um, that would be the the amazingness. Like Max win out, win like nineteen races straight or something, twenty races straight, whatever, however many is left, and just put those records on a shelf. Uh, so next we got Spa, the start of leg one of the Max Home GP doubleheader. Indeed, he given that he has a foot in both countries. Yes, I don't think we've been aware of this at the time. We definitely haven't talked about it. Have we realized that the chance for Max to tie Vettel at nine straight race wins is going to come at Zandvoort? Oh, he's going to do that without question. He just has to win at Spa. Yeah, he can do it in front of the Dutch. Oh, I don't need that. If this is if this is not proof this is scripted, which I absolutely do not believe it is scripted, it is so scripted. Oh, that's a spice to take. Uh, it's not scripted. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I wholly support Max getting that, but I don't need it to happen in Zandvoort just because 
it'll be like 25 minutes between like crossing the line and then somebody's going to get run over because they run out into the cr- into the track it's going to be a disaster the, there are two reasons why i do not believe that this formula one season is scripted Number one, it's owned by Liberty Media, which is U.S. based, and WGA is currently on strike, so they have nobody to write the scripts. Uh, and the second reason would be that if you put this, if you put this script in front of any like story editor, they'd throw it back at you and say, "No, this is stupid and would never happen." I will, I will subscribe to that. I will subscribe to that, uh, unless, of course, uh, you think about it from the perspective of scripted meaning it was predefined and then it was listed, in which case Red Bull, the drinks company, needs really good marketing, so they just bought the whole season. And Liberty Media's profits will be through the roof, not because they've sold all the rights to a bunch of people, but because they got a bunch of back on money from Red Bull. I still really hope that the Red Bull cost cap issue uh, was the um, wholesale cost of Red Bull versus the uh, retail cost of Red Bull. As somebody who works in a large company, I do wonder whether there was an aspect of funny money there. I wholly subscribe to that, which is like, well, we're going to we're going to budget it at retail, but we're actually only going to pay wholesale. And now it's all, all we disagree with that, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Back when that was all happening, somebody did like the math and worked it out to like, it was only like two or three Red Bulls per employee per day. It was like like per working day. It was like a plausible amount of Red Bulls like that could have happened. Not to mention, I'm sure, like, you know, they hand out, I'm sure they hand out Red Bulls to, like, people in the crowds and things like that. So, like, so, like, not even counting, which I assume would also count towards the budget. So, not even counting, like, hot, right, but, like, like not even counting, like, hospitality area Red Bulls, things like that. Like, good, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure that's a, like, that brings that number even more down. I, I so hope that's really what sent Red Bull over, because it was catering. That could have been Red Bulls. Subscribe to that. Um, but we have to remember we're in the wrap-up section, not in the new spicy hot take section. Sorry. Uh, and you've got the last one here. I do. Uh, it's it's a little bit more of a question because I'm not ready to fully commit to it. Is this Perez's last race in the main Red Bull seat at Spa? I'm going to say that that is possible. And the reason I think that there's a, the prediction here to give it a bit more uh, meat, a bit more detail. Uh, Eau Rouge is a, definitely a difficult corner. And I have a horrible feeling that that is going to be Perez binning it on Eau Rouge in one of the qualifyings. And he's going to totally wreck the car. He'll be fine, but he's going to totally wreck the car. And they're just going to be like, this is ridiculous. Danny would never have done that. And they'll swap Danny in. I, I think it really will come down to how well he does at Spa. Because I think he, he saved himself a little bit today in Hungary by getting on the podium. But if he like qualifies well at Spa and decides to go wheeled and wheeled and with Max up a rouge and takes out Max from pole on like going for like his eighth win in a row... And like they and they do uh, like a uh, Spain 2016 and take each other out. Perez is done. I I don't think he's back in the car because like Max has got to complete all the side quests, and this is a side quest, and he's ruining the side quest quest. And it makes it he'd have to restart for he could still do it this season, but he's gonna have to restart from ground zero. I think it's it's also important to remember, and I keep forgetting about this. Red Bull drivers are not contracted with red bull the team or alpha tour they're contracted to red bull racing something something and so moving the drivers between teams is not a breach of their contract yes so perez could be contracted till the end of 2024 but he could be knocked down to alpha tory which would then maybe make him quit well not to mention ricardo is supposed to be driving a mclaren this year he is he was contracted to drive a mclaren this year indeed but but red bull would like to ref, re, respond and, and say that they are matching the contractual terms and therefore even if they bump him down they're still respecting the contractual terms and they don't have to buy him out absolutely i'm just, i'm just saying like you know weird things have happened to where like just because a driver is under contract until 2024 does not mean they are going to be in that seat i will i will i will subscribe to that anything else you want to talk yeah anything you want to talk about i'm good i'm good uh, so we're waiting for your feedback. Always. We are always waiting for it. Write into feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com and let us know your conspiracies, feedback, and wants. Tell your friends to like, listen, rate, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app to the most glorious F1 podcast that has ever been created. And if you happen to have these statistics on uh, driver reaction times to start light hold times, uh, please send it to us. We'd like to know before I have to reach out to anybody.